this is an episode I've wanted to do for a long time. It's really the episode I had in mind when I started the podcast in the first place. And um, I think maybe like the general theory of how you're supposed to do these sort of big episodes is you work up for a while, you get lots of episodes out, build up an audience, and then, you know, boom, you drop something big and huge. And, you know, it doesn't really fit the pattern of how things have gone, right? There's been essentially two episodes. One of them was kind of even a special case, limited audience, different theme. So you're not you're not supposed to publish your big idea as your third work. At least this is the way things go today as you and maybe always since you know think of any person who wants to work up to something you drop it when you have an audience and uh i think you know this podcast has done surprisingly well we've got 250 people slash you know downloads across the two um who knows how much of that is organic and how much of it is family friends but whatever you know if you had 250 people in a room You'd probably be pretty excited to say something. And so I kind of thought, you know what? Screw it. Let's let's go for the big one because you can only hold on to an idea and an energy and a direction for so long before things change. And, you know, I didn't want to lose this. This episode is kind of a tribute uh, to someone who who I never really met but had a profound impact on my life. But I think really is a kind of cultural uh, monument of our age, one who in certain circles is, you don't like to use the word beloved, but you could even say beloved, and who is to the general public not well known at all. And, you know, sometimes there's this feeling, um, I have it often, when you sort of look at what modern times, you know, what are they lacking? And you sort of look back. And this really depends on the person, what they look back to. To me, you know, you sort of look at, um, you know, music is always one to point at. And, you know, certain people will say, oh, you know, rap today, you got to think about uh, Bob Dylan back then. Or, you know, you could go, oh, well, maybe you really should think about jazz as the back then. Or, you know, the true, the hardcore crew will say, no, you got to think about Beethoven. Or some people say, oh, no, Beethoven is done. He's already sending music on the bad path. And really, it's, you know, Bach and all the Baroque stuff and, you know, music before it left the church. However you want to however you want to think about it, the criticism goes that there's, you know, 100, 200 years from now, when people look back here, the impression is, what was our Beethoven? What was our Bach? What was our Bob Dylan? Um, Is this time, this age, the last 10, 15 years, uh, the young people here, are they doing anything of note? Are people going to value our contributions for all time? Or is this sort of a dead period? Is this, you know, whatever was going on between, let's say, 1100 and 1200? Probably something was going on. It's not especially well known to me. And uh, maybe that's the worry, that we're sort of stagnating, whatever. And maybe that's even right. Um I will say one objection that I always uh, think is silly is like, well, you know, they're there, but we just can't see them totally. Um, you, know, you wouldn't really recognize it, and it's, stuff gets better with, with time. That is sort of true, but on another level, you know, if somebody is there doing big monumental work, if they're composing big symphonies, writing big novels, building big companies, uh, that should be obvious to the people at the time that they're at least doing something that seems important. And, you know, maybe whether it's for all time Shakespeare level, for all time Beethoven level, or just, you know, something that was popular in its own age, that, you know, is a question for history to answer, not for the people alive right now. But the argument, the the thesis of this episode is that there's at least one person, one sort of way of looking at the world, which I think will be for all time to admire, and which, unlike most other works of this kind, is actually preserved. It's actually there for all time to to uh, to listen to, to digest, 
and to sort of set yourself up in front of and admire. And I'm talking about the lectures and thought of, of all people, a philosophy professor by the name of Hubert Dreyfus. And Dreyfus has a sort of cult following now as um, you know, people look online for valuable stuff. I would say you know, one of the great things about the internet is that most of what is on there is such junk it kind of gives you the overwhelming impression that maybe the thing you should be doing is looking for stuff that's not junk. And Dreyfus, I think, is recognized, at least by some, as being part of the not junk category. But again, my, my claim is much higher than that. It's that he's actually done something um, which is worthy of civilization-level recognition. And... He died in 2017, and now that there's been sort of a minimal level of distance from what he did, you could just say, I think it's clear that this is someone who uh, you could put not only on, you know, sort of the academic elite, one of the, you know, great philosophy professors of our age. That would just be kind of reductionist way to say it. Um, no, it, he may be one of the great, men of the age, one of, you know, the, the people who have ascended to uh, the level of doing something new and profound and something that generates meaning. That's a rare thing, but it's, I think, wrong to say that it's completely gone in our time. And so the goal today is to recognize it, to convince you that this is the case, and to show that what people are up to in life can be uh, more interesting than maybe the uh, first pass or something like that would suggest. And so with that, I want to announce the title of the episode, which is The Life and Death of Hubert Dreyfus. Now that you've made it through the intro, I will just preface this with uh, the sort of usual disclaimer for long episodes, which is, you know, if you're listening to this and you're just sort of like, well, you know, what's going on on Finn's podcast? How is uh, how's the whole podcast thing doing in general? You may want to listen to, you know, some percentage of this. It's going to be long and hopefully it draws some of you in because it's going to be splitting clips of Dreyfus with uh, clips of me trying to, you know, put it a little bit in context. And so it's probably not going to be, I, I don't know the exact length now, but I'm expecting it to be over an hour. Uh, the consensus from people I've talked to is, well, that's, you know, a little long. Maybe you should, you know, tone it down, get, you know, get more on a roll before you sort of go for these big, long, giant episodes. And, you know... The advice is in some ways appreciated, but won't be heeded. Uh, this deserves a long episode. But, I mean, go, boom, do the whole thing, do it through. Uh, if if you're drawn in, you're drawn in. If this makes you go look up, you know, Dreyfus on YouTube or some other podcast thing, and you realize, well, shoot, you know, Here's Moby Dick, a big, long book, a novel, maybe sort of dry in some people's minds. And here's eight hours of this guy talking about it. Wow, that's sort of a lot of talking. Uh, it is a lot of talking. And so maybe what you should think is not, wow, you know, an hour plus episode of Finn's podcast is pretty long. 
realize, you know, Long is Dreyfus on Moby Dick. Long is, you know, a, a full course on uh, existentialism or Heidegger or whatever else. And this is kind of a taster, a teaser, hopefully to get you interested and to show you that thinking about uh, the great works and the great ideas of the past is not just sort of like, you know, listening to music that makes your brain tingle and say, wow, that's a nice intellectual exercise. I'm, you know, I'm warming up the brain and no, no, the, the idea here is for it to be intrinsically meaningful for the, the contribution to uh, how you think about what you're supposed to be doing and the demands that the world puts on you, that that's kind of the, the realm in which Dreyfus operates. And so anything about him, I think, necessarily adopts the same burden. Um, who knows, you know, could, could be up to the task, could not be. But here we go. So the first thing to say about Dreyfus as sort of the general framing is just sort of what he did uh, in like on a Wikipedia level. He was a professor of philosophy at Berkeley and he gave courses on philosophers that were popular with the uh, post, post-war post crowd, I guess you could say. So he was known as sort of an early guy who was interested in the German philosopher Martin Heidegger. Um, and so Heidegger now, I would say, is considered one of the two important people uh, in philosophy in the 20th century. And I guess like, you know, a lot of maybe you could say like novels too, you know, there was a sense that while philosophy really went gangbusters um, during the Enlightenment and then it had a lot of interesting work going on in, you know, after that, but it has certainly tapered off. And if you wanted to say like who the greatest living philosopher is, you could answer that question. But usually when you answer that question, it's not for originality. It's the fact that they're a very smart person who's very good at, you know, Latin or Greek or German or French. And they're a great interpreter that sort of after they write a book about somebody else like Kant or Descartes or some, you know, big name Shakespeare level philosopher, they then add their own sort of two cents. And that's what a great philosopher is today. And that is in some ways what Dreyfus is doing. But what Dreyfus does, which I think is much, much better is when he gives lectures, he gave lectures at Berkeley, you know, for however many years. I think he was a professor there for about 30. But he gave lectures which were, you know, undergraduate philosophy lectures that didn't uh, adhere to the general arc of what you do when you go to college and you take a philosophy class. And the general arc of what you do when you go to college and take a philosophy class is you go through the history of civilization reading philosophy as civilization goes on. So that means you start with uh, Plato or even, you know, before that, the pre-Socratics, and you move through, go to Aristotle and you, you know, boom, 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 all the way through. I think the reason that makes sense is almost all of the other philosophers did the same thing. And so they have some idea that is responding to something that was going on before them. And if you don't understand, you know, sort of the, the ideas that were in the air, then you won't understand sort of their innovation. But I think Dreyfus almost does the opposite. He sort of says in a, in a way that uh, social critics do, the world is in a particular spot today. People feel, I don't know, like uh, uh, you, you could say nihilism. That, that's the word that he will uh, use. They will feel like they have no uh, meaningful way to go through the world. And that this is a demand that um, philosophy has, uh, this is a problem philosophy is supposed to answer. And uh, he, I think he gives brilliant answers, but he, it's not one answer. I mean, he get, there's a class he teaches on um, sort of the great books of uh, the Western canon and sort of how they can answer the question. There's a class he gives on existentialism and how they can answer the question. Several classes he gives on Heidegger and how Heidegger sort of has a sense, uh, one, on how to answer that question, and two, why um, poetry and literature and things that aren't sort of philosophical treatises are actually better at answering this question uh, on a human level 
um, and maybe why philosophy itself had sort of become decayed and no longer able to rise to the challenges of the modern or postmodern times. But Dreyfus gave these lectures at Berkeley to classes of undergraduates, and he recorded them. This is a sort of an innovation, but whatever. Thomas Edison invented recording, not the newest thing. But he put them up online. In fact, uh, podcasting at, at its origin was basically invented by Apple, popularized by Apple, whatever, when they put podcasts in iTunes in 2004. And uh, I don't know the inside story. I, if I had to speculate, I would say somebody at Apple or someone had something to do with podcasts knew that this is a guy that whose lectures you might want to record and put online because they're not teaching you calculus per se. There aren't strict prerequisites in a material sense. It's really sort of a, a feeling you're supposed to have about your own life, which introduces you to the need for a lecture like Dreyfus gives, almost sermon-like, you could say. And so a class is recorded, and... Uh, Apple actually did some of the audio engineering and paid for it and whatnot and put it on the platform to try and get people to do podcasts. And it became kind of a cult hit. Remember, the, the, these are basically literature and philosophy classes at, a, at an elite university. It's not um, pop philosophy necessarily in the sort of the way you see people write books where you know, it has a big title and it's like how to live a happy life Maybe there's some guy smiling. He's got like five rules, right? Um, you could say 12 rules even. Uh, this is basically a class that was unchanged from how it was meant for Berkeley students put online. And I think it reached number 50. There was a, a an article in the Los Angeles Times about how drives have become so popular, reaching somewhere a along number 50 in the most popular podcasts Again, I think 2004 or five time frame. It even mentions basically the structure of how journalists work. They go, okay, here's something interesting. Rather than try and explain what's interesting, let's just ask somebody uh, who is from like a different walk of life, somebody you wouldn't necessarily expect to be listening to philosophy podcasts. Oh, like a trucker. And so the uh, article mentions like, oh, here's like a trucker who's listening to them as he's going across the country, but he's all of a sudden into Heidegger and Moby Dick and... Um, thinking about existential philosophers and whatnot. Now, there is something a little inspiring in that, but I think the more interesting question is not, you know, can you believe that a trucker is interested in this philosophy class, but is what's different about this philosophy class or what this guy who's teaching the philosophy class is saying that would make it apply to somebody uh, who's not in college and not trying to get a philosophy degree? And so maybe that's what I'll try and answer. And if you want to hear about the trucker, you can find the article. I'll link it even. Very quickly, we're going to dive straight into uh, Dreyfus as a kind of lecturer and some of his ideas and do it almost like a, a class. And that'll be of interest to some of you. And to some of you, it won't be. But before we do that, hopefully this will sort of have the maximum possible audience. I just want to play a brief uh, bit of a brief interview he did where he talks about how he got into teaching and the way that things happened to him in his life. And hopefully this just gives the impression that I got basically from consuming his content in the same way, which is you just listen to him. I've never met the man, um, but was deeply drawn in by the way he talked and the way he thought about the world. And um, we'll go ahead and play that interview now. I'm Bert Dreyfus. I teach philosophy at UC Berkeley, and that's a full-time job. I've always wanted to be a teacher, but I thought I was going to teach physics because that's what I was doing as an undergrad, and then I wandered into a philosophy course on, on Kant, in fact, and thought, wow, that is really interesting and important. And if and if physics may not even be grounded unless Kant's right, and then I got into, and I wrote my thesis on sort of Einstein versus Kant on, on quantum stuff as an undergrad, and, but then I didn't really know enough science to make that my profession, and then I don't know how I somehow got into Heidegger and so forth. Things just 
draw you in and don't, you don't know why. I was just reading in Moby Dick, Melville explaining how he didn't know why he went on this whaling voyage. Certainly that's how it happened to me. I have no reason why I chose philosophy. I think I have, there's a reason, a sort of uninteresting psychological reason why I always wanted to be a teacher. I think, I think it's because I had my younger brother to teach and got all kinds of good, good vibes from mother and dad when I took him by the hand and explained things to him. And I've been doing, doing that with people ever since. I didn't do it on purpose. Of course, you can't do it on purpose. That's the point. But it, and in fact, weird things happened to, to me all the time. Uh, I was explaining to somebody how, whereas most people decide what books they're going to publish and then have to go out and write a prospectus and then chop it around and so forth. I just got called, literally, by uh, somehow somebody, the fates in the background, Melville would say, I was just reading that. But anyway, the, uh, somehow I was, well, I know why. My brother got me called to the RAND Corporation to think about artificial intelligence in 50, in, in 62 or something. But what was funny is, I, and then I wrote a short report, and the next thing I knew, me and the report was in talk of the town in the New Yorker. How? I have no idea. And then the next thing was, Harper, Harper and Rowe called up and said they wanted me to write a book for them right away. And that, that's how it happened. And then this book, I didn't, the book about uh, the, the, the classics and, and, and all things shining and so forth, that was just philosophy six. And I was giving it because I wanted to teach the great classics. And lo and behold, some editor from Free Press calls up and says, do you want to write a book? And it's always been like that. I, I just get battered around by nice things. Yes, I feel that the sort of opportunities come and call me to do them. And they're risky uh, uh, in some way or another. And that's my only contribution is not to stop just because I don't really know about computers and I'm writing a book about them. I'll, I'll find out somehow. Somebody will tell me. In fact, that's what happened. I shopped the manuscript around for about two years for, of what computers can do, learning what computers do and why they can't and so forth. And uh, that it's a, it was a mild risk. I mean, it was just a, could have been a waste of time. I could have made a fool of myself. My favorite philosopher is Kierkegaard, and he talks about letting yourself be drawn into some passionate commitment, which is sure to be risky, and, but if you can do it, rewarding. And so I, whenever I got to Kierkegaard, that sort of connected up with what I was doing anyway. And, and it isn't, I mean, I didn't ever think of myself as doing what was the rational thing to do or the autonomous thing to do or whatever. It, 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 it was just that, the thing that was calling me to do it. And so that's Stryfus. We'll, we'll hear more from him. We'll hear him in a sort of less uh, conversational way. But I do think the point I want to make before we dive into his philosophy is just that today there is a struggle on many levels to get at what I think uh, Dreyfus is trying to get at, which is this sort of disaffected feeling people have. Uh, I, I, you know, you could, now we know what we mean when we say something like disaffected or melancholy or um, depressed or decayed. Uh, and it's just a sort of general feeling that goes along with being alive today. And so I don't think I have to explain it in particularly in-depth terms as a feeling, um, because if you're alive today, maybe you, you have it, or at least a lot of people seem to. It, it's not exactly the newest problem in the world, and it's not exactly the least uh, thought about problem in the world. So there's all sorts of solutions and prognoses and prescriptions and whatnot that you can say about this issue. But I do just want to point out one important thing before Dreyfus uh, sort of gets going and I get drawn up in what he's saying, which I'm sure will happen. Today, I think if you had to split the answers to uh, this feeling of uh, meaninglessness or purposelessness, you essentially have two camps. 
one camp sees it as a problem of human psychology uh, and that I think you could say the caricature of this view is that it's something like a, a chemical imbalance. Humans, certain humans in particular, just never feel quite as good as others. And so maybe they think when they feel this way that there's some big broader social issue or social problem. Um, but really what's going on is their own mind has sort of tricked them uh, into feeling this way. And uh, the thing to do is to untrick their mind. And maybe this is the caricature of behavioral therapy or uh, therapy in general. It's probably, if you had to say um, uh, politically, more on the left. And then I think there's sort of a right-leaning version of this, which is that um, things really have gotten just way worse and that there's no mental trick needed. It's just the case that when people are feeling like um, civilization isn't pointing toward anything worth pointing at or pointing toward anything at all and that their life sort of is following this trajectory that they've actually got the right view of the world that's basically right and the thing to do is to try and get back to a, a point in time when it was so this could mean going back before uh, industrialization or before uh, World War One or before uh, the Reformation Basically, you can pick your poison. You'll find some sort of curmudgeon who thinks things started going downhill at pretty much every date in history. And that I think a lot of um, political disagreements and prescriptions about where uh, the world should go in the next decades can be basically split into these two camps. And I think Dreyfus is in neither. I think he recognizes sort of a truth that, is on both sides. I think from the from the more right leaning side, the more historical decay oriented side, Dreyfus I think acknowledges fairly openly that the world today, and what today means is up for discussion, but definitely today and maybe, you know, fifty years prior or hundred and fifty years prior or whenever you want to mark the start of it, uh, is in its own sort of unique uh, predicament, in a predicament that the Greeks weren't in and the predicament that Dante and other um, people all through the ages, we're in a new predicament. And uh, so on the historical level, this seems to align with the, the right-leaning side. But I think um, where he is so compelling to the university crowd is how he merges that with the fact that it's not just this sort of external decay problem that we're dealing with. It's also the fact that those civilizations in themselves were unable to um, hold up to progress in a certain way, or the, the march of time passed them by. And if they were really the, the last word on how you're supposed to live, if Catholicism in its full high Middle Age unity was really the world that we're supposed to go back to, um, then it's worth asking the question how we ever left it, right? If If we were headed toward a much, much, much better world than we're currently in, and that much, much better world than we're currently in led us to this one, maybe, you know, we've we've overestimated in some ways parts of that much, much better world. And I think this is where he, he will say only at times explicitly this, but implicitly it will be clear that uh, in past ages there was always this internal contradiction that pushes you further along the, the railroad tracks to today. And so from the right-leaning side, he sort of takes uh, a large part, but also has a sort of critique of the we-have-to-go-back crowd. He merges that, I think, with what is undeniably the fundamental conviction of the more left-leaning solution, which is a desire to help people and a desire to show how the human mind can be used uh you know, for good, but can also play tricks on you and can have sort of distorted views about the world and that understanding the world in different ways without even fundamentally changing what it is can be almost as meaningful or just as meaningful as changing what it is. So I apologize for being in the abstract this whole time because, you know, if I was going to try and do it in a sort of specific way that would just take ages and would probably be even less coherent. But that's the divide that Dreyfus is splitting. 
and uh, people like that, people who bridge divides, um, are, are worth thinking fairly hard about. And uh, with that, let's hear Dreyfus introduce Philosophy 6. So we're now set, we're beginning Philosophy 6, From Gods to God and Back, which is also called Man, God, and, God Man, and Society in Western Literature as the sort of general name of Philosophy 6, which was around before I started giving it and doing what I want to do, which is talk about polytheism and what it is and how great it was and how it would be nice if it came back. That is the moral of the course. So that's Dreyfus talking. Uh, he is giving the introductory lecture to Philosophy 6. That's one of the three main classes that he gives that are now cult classics. Uh, this is his sort of introductory remarks. What he's saying is uh, Philosophy 6 is kind of a great books class. Uh, it does philosophy by reading the great books in literature. Um, and it starts off with the Odyssey, and then it does Virgil and uh, Dante. Uh, it goes right through and sort of caps the whole thing off with uh, Moby Dick, which certainly we'll get into. Um, but the thing to worry about, uh, the thing that's interesting uh, in what he's just said is, you know, th this isn't really how you're supposed to, how if you find other philosophy classes uh, online, this isn't what you're, you set it up by saying, we're going to try and understand what X person who is extremely intelligent uh, wrote and, you know, as he said, test their arguments. And this is kind of uh, a different burden. I mean, you, you don't hear it in exactly what he said, but in how he said it, you can see he, there's a kind of life-changing uh, burden that he's actually laying out almost, you know, explicitly and saying, we're going to try and get you to understand what it is to be in a, in a different way. Um, and this, I think, uh, implicitly responds to this whole present age problem, which is, you know, we're sort of passionless, uh, always thinking, always viewing things as resources, as advantages and disadvantages. And, uh, you know, maybe existence is even on hold, never really being who you most are. Um, he says it's a class about polytheism, which I think is great. You know, uh, maybe that's the kind of philosophy you should subscribe to. Maybe not. But at least let's understand it fully in its merits. Uh, and you can see why now it takes the structure of almost a sermon, um, something that you uh, set yourself up to listen to wholly as, as a person and not as uh, necessarily a student who's trying to, you know, minimize or maximize uh, a grade or, you know, a particular argument of a particular philosopher, which they'll then use to write a dissertation or a thesis or something like that on. And that's how Dreyfus introduces the course. That's kind of how he talks. He, he It's a bit rambly, but certainly, you know, everything he's saying is uh, in his head and if, I think it's felt in a genuine way. Um, next, let's hear what he does at the end of the lecture, this, the same lecture, this introduction to this kind of great books class, which is, he says, a class about polytheism. I think really what it is is a class about how people understood uh, what God was through uh, time and how there's different ideas of what that is. And um, this is basically what he'll talk about in the next sort of closing quote. So let's hear that. So the work, and I'm going to just say three minutes of things. The works of art we read in this semester, except for Pascal and Moby Dick, because they're already past the point where you can do it, maybe, or at least Moby Dick is, they do the job of the temple and the cathedral. They unify and hold up to the people their understanding of being. That is, I said, that's what Homer and Aeschylus and Virgil and Dante do, each in their own way, which we'll talk about. And uh, perhaps... There's nothing doing that job for us now, and maybe there never will be again. And maybe, therefore, we have to think differently about what gods are and what work, how works of art could work. When, but we're going to do the Homer, classical Greek, Roman, medieval, and modern world and see how each of them is uh, focused in a work. See, but Moby Dick doesn't have anybody all, nobody, it doesn't unify the culture. Not everybody says, ah, oh, Moby Dick, that's what tells us what we really are and what we're all about. And it's, but, but I think Melville's trying, and he does more than most. Okay, now let's see what else. 
Uh, okay, one last remark. That obviously there are lots of different meanings of God that I've been using. And I, since it's in the title, I owe you something to say something about that. There is, and we're used to, the Judeo-Christian monotheistic creator God, or at least a lot of us are. A lot of us aren't, too. This is no longer simple, homogeneous Western culture. Uh, but but it, certainly the dominant understanding of God right around here is this monotheistic creator God view. But um, And then there are works of art like the Greek temple or uh, like Marilyn Monroe in the most sort of scaled down version, which articulate some, either the whole unified culture or, or at least shine and hold up something uh, that gives people some sense of who they are and what they're up to. That's another kind of God. That's a Heidegger kind of God. And then there's the multiplicity of gods in the Odyssey. And that's a whole big story of its own. It's certainly not monotheism. All right. So he set up the class. Maybe you're now interested. Say, wow, let's hear what Homer is saying and all these people are going to say. And the full lectures uh, are going to be made available. I'll put them uh, up on the podcast website, uh, along with a sort of machine-generated transcription, which you should be able to sort of dig through if you're looking for a particular point. Um, uh, beyond that, I also plan to, and this should be on the website shortly after release or maybe even at release, set up a separate RSS uh, you know, podcast feed. It should be searchable in your podcast app, and you just want to search um, Hubert Dreyfus Collection or something like that, and I'll put up uh, all of the audio. His lectures are sort of still available on iTunes, although iTunes has um, taken out the iTunes U um, podcasting stuff where this was all sort of aggregated. And so I'll, I'll repost it in its full thing. And if, you know, you're hooked from any of these quotes, obviously go listen to it. Um, but the thing to talk about in that quote, which is just a fascinating kind of idea, is that what we call God or whatever, you know, uh, God is, could be this sort of uh, creator God of... Catholicism or Christianity or Judaism, sort of, or Islam, um, but that we as modern people in the West have actually sort of adopted, uh, in a way, what he calls the Heidegger kind of God, um, or at least Heidegger sort of thought that there was a way to say what God was even beyond the sort of particular religious interpretation of how you're supposed to interact with him. And that's the kind of God that unifies a people and a culture and a way of life in an elevating way. I think the way he says it, which is it's a, a, a God for, for Heidegger, maybe for us, is a kind of thing that tells you who you are. And uh, his claim, which is, uh, again, sort of a life-changing, altering claim maybe— is that we're living in a world that doesn't do that, that can no longer do that because of something, maybe some combination of the way we've set up uh, the world and society and the way that we view ourselves and uh, all kinds of structural things, the way we think about um, taking actions and risks and being committed to something. Uh, and so if it's the case that this is true, I, I submit that there is a kind of uh, extreme burden to investigate whether... We are still a society that can create the kind of thing, the kind of God that can tell us who we are. Um, the We'll have to talk about, uh, at some point in this podcast, Moby Dick and his interpretation of Moby Dick. And his claim, you know, is not that it's just some sort of epic whaling novel or even that it's one of the great books of the Western canon, but that what Melville is basically doing, marking... Uh, a similar date to what Kierkegaard said in the present age, right around 1850. He's sort of marking the end of when this old version of telling you who you are worked and that now uh, it, it's either no longer possible for us or you just have to sort of slide between multiple different interpretations. Um, I think, you know, one could even accuse us of a kind of atheist nihilism. Uh, I think you, you have to label it in whatever way is going to make sense to you. But um, that's, that's the quest of, of Dreyfus's course, not only Phil Six, but the others too. But he sort of says it, boom, right out there that, you know, uh, 
we have a question, and uh, it's whether or not we can still figure out who we are. So uh, let's do Moby Dick now. Um, his interpretation of Moby Dick is as the end of what all of these other books were trying to do. There's no stable ground to be on. The world of the Odyssey and of the Aeneid and uh, Aeschylus and Dante, all of this uh, sort of centering, telling you who you are stuff doesn't work in Moby Dick. And one of the key uh, ways that he points this out is in Moby Dick, you have always this dichotomy between uh, ocean and land. And stuff on the ocean is free, it's groundless, it's infinite, it's mysterious and dark. And um, we'll hear some quotes from Dreyfus and from the book that try and deliver it. I will just say one brief thing. Uh, if you haven't read Moby Dick, again, this is just a really dense, long um, it's not a difficult book in the sense that you can't read it, but it's a book that probably isn't going to be on your nightstand for fun. I think on the one hand, you might think this is, again, that's good, right? If this is going to be a life-changing thing, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to suffer through it. So if you have read it or uh, are going to read it, good. If not, though, the brief uh, thing that you might need to hear what Dreyfus is going to say about it is that the main character's name is Ishmael. And Ishmael, um, well, actually, Dreyfus says this, so we'll actually let him go ahead and explain the whole Ishmael situation. But I'll just say that uh, the brief thing you need to know about Moby Dick is it's about uh, this guy, Ishmael, going on a whaling voyage. And it's just full of very unique, iconic characters. And um, the Moby Dick uh, is a whale, a white whale. And the book is the story of Ishmael getting on this whaling ship called the Pequod, leaving Nantucket and going all around the world for several years chasing after this uh, big white whale. Um, but So now let's hear Dreyfus introduce um, Ishmael and, uh, and Melville and, and Moby Dick. So since the first sentence of Moby Dick is, call me Ishmael, the first thing is to talk about Ishmael, who is also, that's Melville's, so to speak, name in the book, but it's really Melville himself is Ishmael. And Ishmael is a wanderer. He was the Abraham's illegitimate son, cast out by Sarah when they had their own legitimate son, Isaac. And he then became an outcast and a wanderer. I take it from Melville's point of view, he's the perfect example of somebody that has no world of his own, no identity of his own. And notice that the writer of the book isn't even named Ishmael. He says, call me Ishmael. We don't know the, the name of the writer of the book. And as for Melville, in the copy of the book that you all have, the Signet Classic, I was struck, I never saw before, a brief summary of Melville's life which is, sounds pretty uh, Ishmaelish. So that's how Dreyfus introduces Moby Dick and uh, the protagonist Ishmael. There's a lot to say about this interpretation of gods as being kinds of moods. Um, he says this is the Greek version, and I think what he's playing off of and talks about in other lectures is uh, how in the Odyssey, uh, the Greek gods like Athena and Others are, um, they, they appear and put you in certain kinds of moods and they even are representative of certain kinds of moods and that's one of the reasons you have so many of them and they appear at different times and are always fighting each other off because that's kind of how moods are. Again, that's a very fascinating idea but sort of as a philosophical argument, it doesn't hold much weight, right? We would say Greek gods basically aren't real. Moods are things that take humans out of the realm of rational thought and take them away from knowing uh, what the truth is. And I think, so Dreyfus is saying uh, Homer and Melville are going against that. And their argument is not a line-by-line uh, -line refutation. It's a sort of explanation of people's lives and how they live. And the characters are fictional, but the claim is that you're supposed to feel a kind of truth when you hear it. Um, this next passage, 
that uh, I'll have Dreyfus read out from Moby Dick is my favorite from the whole book uh, by like a long way. It's one of my favorite passages uh, in anything. It's from the chapter The Spouter in, and he'll sort of introduce it. Again, uh, we won't go way into the plot of Moby Dick because it's kind of a big giant book and the lectures are out there if you want to hear them. And this podcast is going to be out Dreyfus, not Moby Dick or the Brothers Karamazov or Heidegger or any thing in particular. But uh, this passage kind of stands on its own because it's right at the start. And what happens in it is uh, Ishmael just walks into this inn on Nantucket Island the night before he's going to sea on a long whaling voyage. And there's a painting on the wall and it's lit in this interesting way, and it's painted in such a way that you can't actually make out what it is. Um, and he's got this absolutely just enthralling way of describing it. And uh, we'll have Dreyfus read that now. So now comes the next thing. We want to, I have been saying, but I haven't really given you any examples of this important way that everything is indeterminate. And, and, in, 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 and there is no way anything is. There are only interpretations. He does it in this funny way on, in cha on chapter 3, the spouter in on page 10, where he sees a picture. And he goes and what he does every once in a while, when he's about to say something important, he switches from I to you and sort of brings you in. So here we go. We're brought in, entering the gable ended spouter, spouter inn, you found yourself in a wide, low, straggling entry with old fashioned wainscots and so forth. And, so. and then on one side hung a very large old painting, oil painting, so thoroughly besmoked and in every way defaced that in the unequal cross lights by which you viewed it, it was only by diligent study and a series of systematic visits to it and careful inquiry of the neighbors that you could in any way arrive at an understanding of its purpose. Such unaccountable masses of shades and shadows that at first you almost thought some ambitious young artist in the time of the New England hags had endeavored to delineate chaos bewitched. And he loved, and it is chaos. That's another word he's got for it. Um, and he says, a boggy, soggy, squinchy picture truly, enough to drive a nervous man distracted. Well, that's just a pointing ahead. There is a nervous man in the book who is completely distracted by things he can't get a grip on and understand. And, of course, that's Ahab. He even says that he wants a solid grip in this slippery world. Well, this is not a solid grip. That there, is, there was, but he loves it, there, yet there was a sort of indefinite, half-attained, unimaginable sublimity about it that froze you to it so you took an oath with yourself to find out what the marvelous painting meant. And then he goes through this game of interpretation. Every, uh, every, ever and anon, a bright but, alas, deceptive idea would dart through you. It's the black sea in a midnight gale. It's the unnatural combat of the four primal elements. It's a blasted heath. It's a Horborian winter scene. It's the breakup, this is my favorite, it's the breakup of the ice-bound stream of time. Go far and further out. But at last, all these fantasies yield to one portent to something in the picture. Uh, that once found out, all the rest were plain. But stop, does it not bear a faint resemblance to a gigantic fish? Ever, even the great Leviathan himself? In fact, the artist designed seemed this, a final theory of my own and so forth. So one, he, he says it's in a whale, but he also says it's just the way it seems to him. It's his theory that it's a whale. He's got all the pieces in there. And moreover, it turns out the whale has no face, so you couldn't really paint the whale. You can't paint the whale, he says later, as it is under the water, and you can't paint the whale as it is when it's out of the water, because then it's just a kind of floppy mess, and it ceases to look like a whale. So, so that's Okay, that's the, 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 the first version of the game of interpretation, which the book is all structured by. Uh, so there's so much going on there to talk about. Um, one is the point Dreyfus is making, which is uh, how you have this object which everyone sort of interprets in their own way. You can't quite make out what it is. And so um, this plays a 
very strong contrast to the kind of unifying role that these objects play in the world of Dante and even in Homer and other cultures of the past where you wouldn't say the painting is the Christian God, but the painting serves as a work of art, as a kind of kind of God, a kind of unifying thing where everyone, the, the painting, I'll just use the phrase I've been using, tells you uh, who you are. And again, part of who you are is being a human being, what you're supposed to do and uh, the burdens that you have and uh, how you act. And it's not in a sort of procedural, psychological way necessarily of how you greet somebody, but it's your whole being, your whole existence is uh, gathered up and unified by this object. But so the painting, uh, the contrast of the painting is that it's it's unifying only insofar as it's indeterminate. It doesn't actually give uh, any two people the same interpretation at all. So Ishmael's interpretation of the painting is that it's the whale. and uh, But other people have other interpretations. And so, again, he's sort of unifying the culture, telling people who they are around this work of art, which doesn't tell you anything. Um, it, it unifies only insofar as it's indeterminate and indefinite. And this is a theme that is carried out through the whole book. And maybe, you know, uh, one takeaway is that, sure, this is what it is to be an American. What it is to be a Greek is to be unified around a story like the Odyssey. And what it is to be an American is to have a bunch of different interpretations of uh, everything. And that's what makes it so dynamic and uh, everything else. And that's the nice way to read it. For Melville, though, uh, maybe it's a little bit more um, despairing. He seems to think that this change is something that isn't really recognized and that maybe you can do tremendous damage if you go about living in a world that uh, is the world of the indeterminate painting, but that you don't know is that world. Where if you are sort of a hard line anything, that you go on in kind of crazy ways doing crazy things, uh, but you don't really realize that it's all interpretations. You could even think, too, that this uh, idea is really just a very, you know, literary uh, way of doing this sort of postmodern game of saying everything's interpretation. There's no such thing as objective truth. And I think that's almost where Dreyfus wants to lead you. And uh, I think he will have problems with sort of the postmodern canon, Foucault and uh, Derrida and sort of all of these, a lot of them are French or, you know, continental philosophers uh, of the 20th century who play this uh, same sort of game as Melville's. I will say, though, I mean, if that's the game you're playing, if that's the game Melville is playing, you want Melville as your spokesperson and um, not Foucault or a lot of these kind of French jokers. However, um, it might be the case in this painting example that it's not, I mean, you. I think Dreyfus, we'll just say, Dreyfus is saying that, that this shows that everything is interpretations. One way to take it slightly differently is that uh, his interpretation sort of of it being a whale but the whale itself being the thing that you can't paint in the first place, so painting of the whale, painting of a thing that's unpaintable, is it's not really a rejection of truth at all. It might just be that this is the kind of truth that exists. It's a kind of contradictory thing that uh, is very difficult to express, but is still there. So again, I, I do want to make a sort of a philosophical uh, aside to Dreyfus's interpretation. One version, as I've said, is there is no truth. It's all interpretations. And Dreyfus gives his sort of brilliant eight-hour-long run of Moby Dick with this as his goal. Another reading, though, is that uh, it's in these contradictory sort of places, paintings of things that can't be painted. Uh, you know, some German people, Hegel or whoever else, would jump on that uh, internal contradiction and say, aha, exactly, you have stumbled on what is the objective truth. It's this, this struggle t between internally contradictory things to resolve themselves. 
and that while you might say if everyone's just interpreting the pain of oh it's a it's a tree it's the ocean it's the sun it's the you know breaking up of the ice bound stream of time as uh melville says that would be a kind of wrong thing but the the true interpretation the the truth to get at in the the thing that even could still be unifying is recognizing that what it is is an internally contradicting thing it's a pain of a thing that can't be painted it's a picture of a whale. Switching gears slightly from interpreting Moby Dick with Dreyfus, um, let's think a little bit about what Dreyfus is doing in these lectures in the first place. Um, it kind of has this feel of an English class, right? You have a book, you read quotes from the book, uh, and there's a sort of structure going through interpreting various passages. Nothing uh, really wrong with seen it like that. But again, I'm claiming in this episode that Dreyfus is trying to, you know, change people's lives for the better and that he actually is doing it. And so there is a question in uh, the passages that I've played from Dreyfus's lectures, is he changing people's lives um, just by reading quotes out of Moby Dick and saying, right, you know, here's how to interpret this book or here's how you do interpret the Odyssey. I mean, after all, this does occur all across the world, people read the great uh, works of their own tradition and other traditions, and they analyze them, write papers about them, they admire certain characters and critique others. Um, but so let's even take this sort of spouter in thing to the next level entirely and say what Dreyfus is kind of implicitly doing here is suggesting that this is the kind of thing. I guess what, he, what I'm trying to say is this is what it is to be a human being, is to uh, look at the world in the way that Melville is looking at the world, or not just Melville, but in this case, Melville. And you would say, well, of course, right? He's telling a story about what people are doing. Well, I think not entirely, right? Embedded in this indeterminateness is a critique of a kind of scientific view of the world, uh, I'm not trying to, you know, start any big scientific debate, but I will say one of Dreyfus's most firm stances, one of the things that sort of made him famous in his early days, was his criticism of uh, people trying to create artificial intelligence on computers. And he didn't make the any of the critiques we're familiar with today, which are like, well, you know, you, you shouldn't do it because it might... Uh, take away people's jobs or that you shouldn't do it because it could become an evil sort of Terminator style thing and realize humans are flawed and get rid of them. He's saying you can't do it. It's actually an impossible thing to make a machine that imitates a human because humans aren't machines and the things they do that make them human aren't anything machine-like. If what a human is is the tasks that humans complete, you know, building things or solving math problems or whatever else, that's, that's machinable. That's AIable. But his criticism always, and it's actually very in-depth sort of criticism about how we deal with perception and moving and understanding the world and everything, uh, is at its core the same criticism that Melville is leveling uh, implicitly when he talks about the painting being interpretations, which is, find me a programmer or a scientist who can uh, do tests about uh, this painting and whether w will those tests lead you to the conclusion that it's a painting of a thing that can't be painted because if they do that would be bad science that would be bad programming you you have uh, you have a and not a at the same time and the claim is this is this is the human way we have a and not a in the same picture and the way you describe it is by writing a passage like the spouter in um, Again, this is a theme in Moby Dick, but it's a more importantly a theme in Dreyfus's life. He, he has it in the AI thing. He has it in this Phil Six class. He has it, I think, uh, maybe most directly in his Heidegger classes. The, the takeaway here is maybe, you know, part of the reasons that humans are having particular issues today in the modern time, issues of meaning, issues of dealing with the world is that they have the wrong idea, a flawed idea, uh, a, 
a corrupted idea of what it is to be a human in the first place. And if that is truly something that Dreyfus is arguing for, and if it's even true, that is, again, Beethoven-worthy, Shakespeare-worthy. That elevates him to the level of Melville and these other people. Um, hopefully this is something that will become obvious as we hear more from him talking about different uh, authors and books and themes. Again, like Melville, sort of Dreyfus is saying, one of the great things with Melville is he writes characters in the book where you're, you don't know if what's going on, what's being described is Melville's own view or a particular character's view, and uh, he's sort of telling the story and changing your view of the world at the same time. This is what Dreyfus is saying Melville is doing. Again, when people are at their best, they don't totally know that they're doing it, and I think Dreyfus is actually doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, that is, Dreyfus, as he goes through these books, as he goes through these texts, as he gives you his interpretation of them, there is in the background his view of the world, his view of how human beings act and uh, what needs to change to make them better humans. This also leaks through. And so, again, it's on so many different levels that this is going on, right? It's interpreting a book about interpretation by, by a philosopher who himself has his own interpretation of the world, and again, don't try and disentangle it, right? Just just listen and absorb yourself in, in what he's saying. And uh, I think that's how you're supposed to deal with this, as if it's a sermon, right? You don't try and disentangle, well, you know, what gave me a particularly nice feeling coming out of uh, a church, right? Is it the music? Was it this particular line from the sermon? Was it transubstantiation? It's the whole souled human experience. It's not something that you're supposed to uh, reduce to, you know, what kinds of inputs I was getting and how, what kind of chemical output I got. He, I think his argument would be, um, Dreyfus's argument, I mean, is that a human being is fundamentally a painting of something that can't be painted. And uh, if that's true, then the way we're doing philosophy, the way we're doing science, the way we're interpreting ourselves is going to run into problems. If the truth about us is that we can't get a clear picture uh, of exactly what we are because of what we are, and yet we have dedicated our lives in a certain sense to getting as clear a picture as possible, there's tension there, internal tension. The same p tension is in the painting, and... Uh, it is, again, I think a testament to Dreyfus's, his genius and his, his skill as a lecturer that this leaks through um, as a sort of demand on modern uh, humans. So I mentioned before, I think, uh, that the fundamental contrast that Melville draws in Moby Dick is between the land and the sea. And the sea is indefinite, the land is definite. And uh, as much as I would like to say that this is something that I, you know, came up completely originally uh, from reading the book, I can't say that. This is right out of a Dreyfus lecture, and we're going to hear the clip of him explain it. Uh, and this passage is going to deal with all of the themes uh, that I just talked about, basically. Indefiniteness, the fact that this is kind of what a, a human is and is an indefinite thing, and that that's uh, also kind of the contradictory goal of humans is to get definite about uh, certain things. And uh, he has this line, I'll even spoil it, I'll talk about it again after we hear Dreyfus read it, but in Moby Dick there is this line uh, about how th there's this ungraspable phantom of life and that is the key to it all. And the ungraspable phantom of life is a reflection of you, a definite picture of you, which is fake and a sort of uh, I wouldn't even say a trick, is a kind of grand farce, whatever. I mean, something, something like a trick, something that's false, but uh, kind of an elevated version of it. And uh, again, he says, this is the ungraspable phantom of life, and it is the key to it all. So let's now hear Dreyfus uh, talk about indefiniteness, landedness and unlandedness, the sea and the land, and uh, we'll hear that quote. But now, the basic dichotomy of the book, which someone of you mentioned already, the sea and the land, is the, is the way he expresses 
on the one hand, the indeterminate chaos, and on the other hand, the need for something solid, something uh, that you can take a stand on and count on and so forth. And he does it by just contrasting the land and the sea for, for pages and pages and all through the book. But I will just read you a few and give you a list. Uh, I, if I were writing it all on the board, which I won't because there's no, it, nobody here or very few anyway, you've all got it to copy down, I'll give, I can give you a copy. So, But I would have a big list of land versus sea, and here is a bunch of them for you out there in podcast land. Uh, I'm, I'll give you always land and then sea. The land is closed, closed off. The sea is open. The land is marked off. There are landmarks. The sea leaves no records. Um, to tip, take just when he goes to sea, for instance, just to put, not just keep reading, but interrupt this every once in a while. He says, gaining the open water. The wind blew, he's going off toward in the, in the tugboat toward the Pequod. How I snuffed that tartar air, how I spurned the turnpike earth, that common highway all over dented with the marks of slavish heels and hoofs, and how I turned me to admire the magnanimity of the sea which will permit no records. See, no landmarks. So the, then you've heard it's slavish, the land. The sea is freedom. The land is certainty. The sea is mystery. There's comfort versus rigor. Safety versus danger. Solid ground versus bottomless. That's a nice one. I mean, there, is, there, are, there are landmarks, but there are no sea marks. And, it, and there's a bottom, and you stand on the land, but the, you don't stand on the bottom of the ocean. And then there's the definite, that's very important, and the indefinite. I'll read you a sentence for that, because one of his favorite things is the indefinite. If there were ever a God, that would be indefinite for him. He says, but in landlessness alone resides the highest truth. Shoreless, indefinite is God. So, so it's the definite versus indefinite, bounded versus boundless. I like that because I want the whale to be the symbol of... The, the, the sea is the unrepresentable. The whale is kind of the incarnation or mammalization or something of the sea. It's focused in the whale, the sperm whale particularly. And then the white whale is the most extreme of all these things. But So there's this little... At the end of all these funny extracts, which I have, have read you only the craziest, the last one is the most... Important. Oh, the rare old whale mid storm and gale in his ocean home will be a giant in might where might is right and king of the boundless sea. So that's to say he's the exemplar of the paradigm of the boundless. And he's another ex thing is his, he, the sea, the land is finite, the sea is infinite. It's not quite clear what that means, but it, you've got the general idea. He talks about, we'll see again, how in, at, at sea you could perish in the howling infinite and how that would be better than to be ingloriously dashed upon the lee, even if it were safe. And he contrasts philosophy, and, uh, which goes with land, and thinking or meditation, which goes with sea. And those are, the, and those, are those two extreme attitudes well, everybody has got a certain cautious attraction to the sea because the land is so constricting, according to the way he sets it up. So uh, everybody wants to get as close to the water as possible and yet uh, not fall in. And he talks about that. And he talks about this tendency to try to get everything clear and determinate. And, and then and I'm going to talk about that now. There's this tendency to try to grasp the meaning once and for all. And that's what philosophy and religion try to do. And we saw that at its best in, in, in Dante. But he's, his way of talking, he said, thinks it's very dangerous to try to grasp it once and for all. And he thinks that the myth of Narcissus is about that. He says on page 3, about the deeper meaning of that story of Narcissus, who because he could not grasp the tormenting, mild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned. 
But that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. And it's the image of the ungraspable phantom of life. And this is the key to it all. A passage like that, that Dreyfus just read, you just have to admire on a base level how extremely moving the writing is. And uh, the fact that it's a rare uh, talent. Uh, Very few people can uh, muster that kind of sentence and idea and put it all together in a way that, you know, takes this idea out of your mind and puts it into somebody else's in a way that's profound. I mean, it's hard enough just to be understood, (laughs) but uh, to try and communicate any idea which rises above a basic concept is very difficult. And something is going on in that passage which isn't worth dissecting, just kind of worth admiring. One reaction to this world that Dreyfus later in the lecture talks about uh, is this kind of nihilism, uh, heroic nihilism, in the face of a world that is all interpretations, right? If if the land is in uh, Moby Dick or if we step back from this book and just look at uh, life in general when we say indeterminate things, indefinite things, that's the reality in – then and, and interpretations of what something really is, true things, those are bad, those are wrong. Um, the natural reaction, maybe, one of the reactions is just to be at home in this uh, kind of indefinite world and to try and just make your own meaning from sheer force of will. And uh, Dreyfus points out that this is an idea that is in Melville, but it's most famously associated with the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche who is, you know, the most popular philosopher among teenagers probably for for all time. I don't expect this to change even in a thousand years because there is something so interesting uh, about what Nietzsche is saying about life when you're young and full of energy and you say, look, I'll you know, screw it, I'll build a world. How hard can that be? But um, I think Melville, uh, who's writing before Nietzsche, hasn't read Nietzsche, is against this view. He's uh, he's responding to Nietzsche before Nietzsche's even done his thing. And Dreyfus uh, explicitly mentions this. And he says there's even a character in Moby Dick, uh, one that no one ever pays any attention to because he's just sort of in and out in a few sentences uh, by the name of Bulkington. And uh, Dreyfus says, and we'll, we'll hear this, that uh, Bulkington is the representation of the Nietzschean hero, the, the Ubermensch or Overman, as, as Nietzsche calls him. And for Nietzsche, he's, Nietzsche's point of view is, look, this is an extremely difficult thing to do, to uh, recognize that everything is interpretations and indefinite and that there's no truth, meaning, whatever else. And most people can't deal with it. Most people fail and are sort of weak. But there's the exceptional human being, the overman, uh, who is capable of this kind of thing. And Nietzsche's claim uh, is that this brings a kind of endless joy and it, there's something profound about it. So it, Melville's criticizing this, Dreyfus is implicitly criticizing this, and I'll even hop on the train there and say that probably this overman is not joyful, the person who has to build up their own world, and maybe this kind of action isn't even good or even possible by humans. And, you know, you could even make this a kind of cultural thing and say, yeah, you know, of course, freaking Germans are going to say it. this world building will thing is a joyful process. But everyone else knows that this is a miserable uh, existence, something we don't want. And probably, you know, it's one thing not to want it. It's another thing if it's not even possible or true. And so you have to claim both if you're saying it's wrong. And that's what Dreyfus and Melville are saying here. Uh, in this passage, though, Dreyfus is about to do two things. He'll talk about Bulkington. He'll talk about why Melville thinks this is an untenable, uh, joyless existence that humans, uh, being you know the beings that we are, can't muster them. But Dreyfus then lets leak through the cracks even his own desire to redeem in a certain way. And so let's go ahead and hear uh, Dreyfus' interpretation of, you know, does the overman work? Does uh, being the kind of nihilist hero work. Uh, One brief aside, just so you understand all the terms, Dreyfus uses this term ontotheology uh, to mean, like, uh, essentially the the Christian worldview of a a creator god or essentially any god that's going to give you a definite answer about how to live. 
He would even group in the sort of Heideggerian stuff where you look at the pain and it unifies all of you or, uh, you know, you're, you're gathered around the temple and that, that unifies the culture, all of the stuff I was talking about previously. Um, this is grouped into ontotheology. This is grouped into stuff that Nietzsche doesn't like. And uh, that's, that's what Dreyfus is uh, about to talk about. So let's hear it. So here we go for that, for the what I call heroic nihilism attitude. You, the other attitude t- from trying to turn the sea into the land is to accept the groundlessness and enjoy the constant challenge and constantly avoid the temptation to try to grasp it and make sense of it. And there is a hero who does that. You, who, and it looks like somebody who did that would be able to rejoice in their freedom because they will certainly have total freedom and they will have, they ought to enjoy the play of perspectives and they should certainly stand firm against the temptation to settle for any fixed answers. And, in a, and he, now he's going to give you a hero who is half like that. Uh, you'll see in a minute. I mean, that he has, that he's able to stand against the temptation of fixed answers is sure. That he enjoys it and rejoices in it is not the case for Melville. I mean, those who, any of you know, know Nietzsche? I mean, all these in the back of my mind, I have Nietzsche. You, you, you recognize some of this Nietzschean thing. I mean, this is the overman in Nietzschean terms. And well, so let's t- find out about him. There is this fascinating, handsome man who appears on page 14, and he is, uh, he has a sober face, He's very good looking, full six feet in height with noble shoulders, uh, a chest like a coffer dam. I've seldom seen such a brawn, such brawn in man. A face deeply brown and burnt, marked with dazzling white teeth by contrast, while in the deep shadows of his eyes floated some reminiscences that did not seem to give him much joy. That's the interesting thing. The, The way he differs from Nietzsche is he doesn't think heroic nihilism can be joyful. But the man disappears unobserved when everybody else is having a good time, and they all run after him saying, Balkington, Balkington, and that, but we don't see him anymore for a long, long time, until page 101. And 101, they go, they set out from Nantucket to, to the, and the great line, we gave three heavy-hearted cheers and blindly plunged like fate into the lone Atlantic. And now they're off. And what does he see at the helm of the boat? Balkington. When on that shivering winter's night the Pequod thrust her vindictive bows into the cold, malicious waves, who should I see standing at her helm but Balkington? I looked with sympathetic awe and fearfulness upon the man who in midwinter, just landed from a four years dangerous voyage, could so unrestingly push off again for still another tempestuous term. The land seems scorching to his feet. That is, that he can't stand these certainties and these happy parties and, and so forth. Now, now this comes this praise of Balkington. But in landlessness alone resides the highest truth, shoreless, indefinite as God. So better it is to perish in the howling infinite than be ingloriously dashed upon the lee, even if it were safe. Take heart, take heart, O Balkington, bear thee grimly, demigod. Up from the spray of thy ocean perishing leaps straight up thy apotheosis. 102. What an amazing thing. And you just discover that Balkington drops dead that night. We don't know why. He's never mentioned again in the book. He's become a god so that up from his ocean perishing... He his, his apotheosis is he's, he's godlike, but I think the interesting thing is Melville pictures what it would be like to live this heroic nihilist life that Nietzsche admires too very much, and Melville thinks that it would be grim and joyless, and he doesn't buy it. He doesn't uh, doesn't see why we should have... Well, he thinks we are, I don't know whether we're incapable of it, or I guess at least this, we don't have to settle for this. This, And though he admires Balkington, obviously, amazingly, he's the 
if, 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 if God is dead, we have to become gods ourselves, Nietzsche says, and Balkington does it. Um, he thinks that there must be some other way to heal us besides, and he just dumps Balkington. And did we never hear from him again after that paragraph. Do you want to say something? Oh, no. Oh, okay. So, and, and there, you have to resist all the answers. And so, God for Melville... And remember, indefinite is God. What does that mean? God is not the supreme being that's ground of all intelligibility and explains everything. God is the groundlessness. It is the indefiniteness which makes everything endlessly interpretable. That's just another way of saying the same thing I was saying. Uh, but just living in the groundlessness like Balkington isn't somehow satisfying. It doesn't give you the healing you need. It's not enough to be the lieutenant of nothingness, which is a Heidegger phrase for this thing. It's, it's a grim job, and that's about all that he has to say about it. It's a truth, this, this heroic nihilism. Uh, it's a truth that it's all bottomless and ungrounded and non-representable and cannot be grasped. And that, and that is... Uh, a truth that just like that, no normal mortal human being can tolerate it. That's what Balkington is supposed to be. It's, a, it's like saying to Nietzsche, because Nietzsche says all these things like about the overman, the free spirit, that sound just like Balkington, except Nietzsche keeps telling you he's joyful. And I, and I, and I think Melville wants to say, he's, he's pictured him, and he's not joyful. He's grim, and we don't want to be like that. And I think that's a great move on, on Melville's part. Um, so the overman is grim and perishes in the howling infinite, and that's that. That is, there is this extreme possibility of the absence of all meaning. Get, don't even trust any divine glimmers. Take no comfort from any interpretation. Confront the indefinite head-on, You'd have no hierarchies, no center, no even gods, no meaning, no land, and, they, and that's just not going to work. Uh, and so Balkington is never mentioned again. But then this is the, the last thing to say for this lecture. If we've, but if we've rejected onto theology on the one hand, which is the land and the, so to speak, the religions that have an answer, and we've rejected heroic nihilism. So what can heal us? And a lot of the rest of the book is about what can heal us, what can save us in the end. So here I feel like my Dreyfus thesis is um, coming around a little bit. I think this is the supporting evidence that I needed, that this man is not just a teacher. His burden is what he's saying Melville's burden is, which is trying to figure out what can heal us and whether anything in the end can save us. And so, you know, a, a line like that, it's sort of empty, set on its own, but it's maybe also the most meaningful question to ask if you give it the right sort of context. Um, you have to always ask, you know, save from what? What, what do humans even need saving? Um, in the Christian view, yes, and there's a sort of very particular way that you go about saving them. Dreyfus, I, it's fair to say, though he's in that tradition, I don't think is giving you any kind of particularly Christian message. Dreyfus is really taking up uh, unliftable burden here in the sense that he's telling you uh, that this book is going to try and explain how human beings can be saved and more than that, he's even going to give you his view of how that's possible. And Dreyfus even, you know, it's his own view in a certain sense. Uh, maybe Melville would concede if you asked him, right, my book is about how I can save humanity, how, you know, uh, redemption is, is possible. And, uh, but, but Dreyfus isn't going there. He's not trying to prove to you exactly what Melville thought. He's even adding on his own view. Uh, and this, to me, again, is an elevating 
thing for for Dreyfus. It's the reason why it's worth making a podcast called The Life and Death of Hubert Dreyfus in the first place. It's not just a that the, here was a guy who dedicated his life to something. It was here's a guy who dedicated his life to saving to saving mankind. Here you have to say there is an answer. You can go through and listen to uh, the rest of the lectures and you kind of get Dreyfus's p- picture of what this answer is in the context of Moby Dick. But it's wherever you look in this guy's lectures. Uh, if you go and listen to any of them, you'll get a, a similar view on how you can save us. And, um, you know, here I'll even try a bit of German out. There's this line I really like from Hegel, who... Um, Dreyfus and a lot of these more uh, interpretive literary philosophers generally don't like. They see him, he was an idealist. Hegel was a German philosopher who was in the tradition of uh, philosophy as a practice, right? You can draw, you would put him solely in the philosophy world, not in the literary world. He wrote philosophical treatises that are very, very dense. But... um, he has this line in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit, which I remember, you know, hearing it for the first time, and it just sort of pushes you over, uh, and you just had to sit there and and think about it, walk around a bit, turn it over in your head, and as the you know saying goes, this hopefully podcast will show you some lines say more than most, and this line is I'll try my German here, an diesem voran dem Geiste genugt is die große seines Verlustes zu ermessen. In English, it uh, translates to, by the little which now satisfies spirit, we can measure the extent of its loss. And maybe this is the feeling that leads Dreyfus and Melville and all of these other modern people who feel like something is missing, we're supposed to rise to some level that we're not at. You say, how do you know you're not just supposed to be a nihilist. Maybe that's the sad truth of it all. And I think this is the gut feeling, the, the, the human being feeling that tells you that that's probably not right. Um, there are glimmers left of what was once a, a full picture. And that what now, uh, as, as Hegel would say, what now makes us content, what now satisfies us, makes visible the loss that now exists. Um, I don't know how any uh, Dreyfus or uh, any of his sort of true followers would feel about me comparing this, you know, his his life to Hegel uh, and saying, well, you know, it turns out you're actually a, a, a true Hegelian. Um, to most people, that wouldn't sound like anything to get upset about. But I, for him, it would be because their whole thing is dedicated to saying, no, 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 Hegel and the whole ph- philosophical tradition has missed something fundamental about what it is to be a human being, which, okay. But maybe some of them are in there uh, messing the whole thing up, messing up philosophy and life and the whole modern world. Maybe some of them are in there with the same base feeling and they've just you know, executed on the prescription wrong. Um, this, though, does, again, elevate the, the project of what Dreyfus is doing. This lecture uh, is no longer a class about a book. It's uh, a attempt to satisfy more than what was lost. And so I think, you know, as much as when I was talking about the painting and saying, you know, Dreyfus and Melville have this interpretation that it's all... Uh, indefinite, it's all uh, relative, and you know you sort of have to be a, a polytheist. That's Dreyfus's and Melville's view, basically. Maybe you know I'm claiming maybe Melville isn't so much there. Maybe he's secretly you know seeing something in these internal contradictions. But so if it's not the case that I can sort of cop out of this relativism, and if we do follow Melville through to the end uh, with Dreyfus. You don't have a very happy picture. You actually have a sort of uh, shattering picture. And in his conclusion, Dreyfus makes only the slightest turn to uh, a, a happier uh, place. 
But to get there, we've got to do one more thing. So it's going to be one more thing on Moby Dick, then the conclusion. There is uh, in Moby Dick this white whale, uh, which happens to be named Moby Dick. And the whiteness of the whale is, according to Melville, uh, in a letter or something, he said that if you understand what that whiteness is, you know, whales really, they're not white per se, but this is like a particular whale, Moby Dick. And if you understand what that whiteness is, what it represents, what it represents to all of the characters, Ahab, uh, the captain in particular, who's sort of after this, he's on a, a death quest to go kill this whale. If you understand what the whiteness is, you understand the book. That's the claim that Melville makes. And understanding the whiteness doesn't seem like a difficult thing because it's actually a chapter called The Whiteness of the Whale. So you would think, look, you read that, you understand it, boom, you understand the book. Well, you should read the chapter first. It actually is, uh, uh, it's, Moby Dick is dense and this is even denser. Um, but I'll try and set it up. Then we'll hear Dreyfus read the key passage. And hopefully this is going to be the kind of shattering thing that'll lead you to the conclusion and then lead you to maybe want to hear something about how we can get out of this mess. But this, uh, this question of whiteness, absolutely nothing to do with human uh, races or a discussion of, you know, anti-colonial legacy or anything. It's entirely within the book. And the fact that uh, white is a color that, uh, what, it either contains all colors or Melville will say it's actually, it's, it's a colorless color. Whiteness is a colorless color. It's actually devoid of content and a sort of blank, meaningless, indefinite thing, which... Again, this is what Moby Dick is all about, the, the blank, the, the indefinite thing. Um, and this is a, a, a terrifying feature of Moby Dick. He's a big, scary, boat-crushing whale, but the whiteness is just what throws it over the top because he stands for something that is uh, culture-destroying, world-destroying, life-destroying. Uh, that, that whiteness will do you in according to uh, Dreyfus and according to Melville. And understanding what it is, is a kind of bigger, longer version of understanding what that painting in the Spouter Inn is. That is, uh, Melville just gives you all kinds of different interpretations. You know, it could it be this? Could it be that? And those interpretations are a lot longer and include a lot more uh, vocabulary and adjectives and alliteration than my description will. Uh, but he sort of does the same move. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Is this? And then he settles on, at the end, his preferred interpretation. And so what is the whiteness? The whiteness is, I'll even spoil it just because it's so dense, you kind of have to hear it just said in a sentence or two. The whiteness is the meaningless world. It's seeing the world for what it really is, a kind of void, empty, natural thing and th this is the scientific view in a certain way, one that Melville rejects sort of procedurally as, you know, you can't paint the whale, you can't understand the whale, you don't learn about the whale by dissecting it. So he's against a kind of scientific view in that way. But he completely embraces, according to Dreyfus, a world that is devoid of any of the, the brilliances that we might like to think are there, at least insofar as they're objectively there, right? So if you see a sort of spark of divine somewhere, that's you and that's your interpretation, but it's, it's not there there, that the world as it really is, the world in itself is white. It's absent of color. And that's what is devastating about this whale. So let's hear quickly this, I think, beautiful passage, uh, that uh, is in Moby Dick. We'll have Dreyfus read it, and hopefully you can get that idea out. That the the devastating thing about whiteness is that it leads you to a world uh, which is absent any meaning. Uh, Melville will use the term uh, atheist. And now he tells you on eighty eight what it is. It's pretty strange. Two thirds of the way down, and he does it in terms of questions. He doesn't give you the answer. Not Melville. Is it that by its indefiniteness, it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe and stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? That's getting close. That's still not it. 
Uh, but its indefiniteness is now in there, which is important. The whiteness is not in any particular color. And, uh, and the whole sort of frightfulness of the universe is in there. Pascal said he was the first to get the news that the universe was infinite. I mean, the first generation of people. And he said it, it, it terrified him. But now that's not it yet. Or is it that, as an essence, whiteness is not so much a color as the visible absence of color, and at the same time the concrete of all colors? Is it for these reasons that there is such a dumb blankness full of meaning in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless all color of atheism from which we shrink? That's the crucial sentence. It's pretty... Pretty obscure. You can go back and look at it. The sort of... So if the key to Moby Dick is figuring out what the hell that passage says, and it's a whole big chapter, but that's one of the key moves of it, then uh, the, the, the key to Moby Dick is a kind of melancholy one. It's uh, a work of art that is telling you that though the scientific reduced view of the world is scientific and reduced, there's not some um, enchanted one lying behind it ultimately. There's only an enchanted one lying behind it for you. And that means it's relative. That means there's no objective truth. You can't sort of stand on it absolutely. There is, uh, you know, to use the land sea analogy, there's no true land. There's land only for you. Um, I don't accept this. I don't think Dreyfus even accepts this. I don't even think this is necessarily what Melville does with the book. I think the book even portrays that there's more going on. But let's not try and turn a tragedy into a comedy. Um, Moby Dick does, I won't spoil the ending of the book, but let's say it does not go well for the sailors and the Pequod, and the whiteness seems to win. And that means that... Uh, it's a kind of devastating, world-destroying thing that's really there. And so that's a, a contrast. That's not Homer. That's not Virgil or Dante or Aeschylus or uh, any of these other people that Phil Six talks about. And that's not a warm, cozy thing that you would expect out of a man who I have claimed is trying to save humans um, from uh, a meaningless life. And so if that's right, let's hear how Dreyfus is going to close out the course. He does just, as I said, the briefest of turns. In this passage I'll play, he sort of gatekeeps a little bit and says, only the Heideggerians will understand. Well, I'll do my best in the next uh, few minutes here to, to help everyone understand. W what Dreyfus says is Heidegger's got this idea that a poet shows up in a needy time and keeps open certain possibilities, certain ways out of the devastation of whiteness, the devastation of complete relativism. And the way he keeps these possibilities open is by being a poet, by revealing things which cannot be revealed except by um, someone who uh, has a transformative sort of power. Um, now, and I'll even spoil what Dreyfus is about to say, he says... Right, the gods of the past are dead. He's not trying to be a Nietzschean provocateur about it. He's saying the the we don't live in the Greek world. We don't live in uh, the world of paganism or anything else, really. And that uh, Melville's idea is, well, you sort of pick one, you have uh, a view for yourself, and that's good enough, a sort of uh, a polytheism. And maybe Dreyfus is kind of a polytheist, but he's also thinking, you know, how do you view Moby Dick as a work of art as a whole? What, what is it? Is it a poet in a needy time? And his answer is yes. He says Melville is keeping open possibilities. Maybe he's not saving us, but he's, you know, it's a needy time. If it was a great time, he would have saved us, but it happens to be needy. And so we happen to just need possibilities kept open. So let's hear, this is the last uh, of a, the semester-long Phil Six course that ends with applause, which I'll keep in. And this is how uh, 
It wraps up. So my conclusion then is that we definitely, what is, what, is, what is Ishmael telling us then, or Melville? We have to bring, if you're going to live a meaningful life, and you happen to be one of the people who aren't convinced anymore by ontotheology and don't believe there's a supreme being, and if you are sophisticated enough not to anymore be in the modern uh, uh, autonomy con business either, then what you've got to do is... Uh, you got the, the, there is the possibility. Well, I listed all the things that it's not to sum up. So how should we act now? That the Homeric gods are gone, the Aeschylus gods are gone. When these things are dead, they're dead for good. Uh, their works of art don't work for us anymore. Virgil and Augustus don't work either, and neither does this unconditional commitment story if of of uh, 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 Father Mapple. So you get this proposal to take all these moods as divine gifts. So you gotta, I'm just gonna say it one more time as I wrote it here, give up onto theology a life grounded in revelation, reason, or unconditional commitment. Give up will and autonomy. There's no way that we can posit things mattering for us and having meaning in our life. You've gotta be willing to accept risk and sorrow, Neil Schmiel says, and, be, and then you've gotta be grateful for whatever ontological moods, that is worlds, that is gods, grab you and have authority in your life, then you will be open to relative meaning and relative happiness. And I think you will be saved or cured. Now I want to say something that only Heideggerians will understand, but it fascinates me. Heidegger thought that there was a special kind... If you ask me, but is this a work of art, this? Well... It certainly doesn't have a culture built around it, and nobody's making altars to it like they did to the Divine Comedy or to, to the Aeneid, or they don't perform it every year or read it every year on in the National Public Radio. It's not that kind of work of art. But Heidegger knew that there wasn't any more that kind of work of art. But he, he thought that there was a German poet, which he was very impressed by, Hölderlin, and that this poet was what Heidegger called a, a, a poet in a needy time. And he was making a kind of work of art for a needy time. And what does, what does Hölderlin do? He talks about the Greeks and the gods and the hope that there could be a return of the gods. And he keeps that possibility, so to speak, open. That's all you can do in a needy time. You can't have a work of art as you could when there was still some kind of unity in the culture. And in a way, all I want to say only to myself in a way is, this is our Hölderlin. He is our poet in needy times. And this is the only kind of work of art you can have now. And that makes it a work of art of sorts. That's it. Sorry I talked too long. So, kind of a bummer. Kind of, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a tragedy. This course in a certain way because it shows you a past full of brilliant shimmering worlds and tells you that our world can't muster the same same kind of god same kind of unifying thing if you want uh, something to tell you who you are it, it it's tough now um and in a certain sense Let's not sugarcoat it. The reason to make a podcast like this at all, the reason to be Hubert Dreyfus and dedicate your life to doing this sort of work is because this is a demand that the world puts on you. And, uh, be, you know, the, the task is great because the, the problem is great. So I don't think there's any more turning this over into a good thing to do here. All that, though, to say, there is, again, this feeling that, wow, this course is doing something that is more than a course. It's not a course that changes your life. It's not even a lecture that you are profoundly impacted by. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of testament to existence. <laughs>